Today on our podcast, we have a very exciting guest. This person is a trailblazer in the industry of sport, especially squash. He has paved the way for so many squash people, squash players in India. He's got a Commonwealth silver medal under his belt. He's got Asian Games gold, silver, bronze, you name it, he has it. He's also an Arjuna Wadi, someone who we all look up to. He is ranked number 15 in the world, number one in India, someone who I've had the pleasure of knowing beyond the squash court. Ladies and gentlemen, Rhea and I are super excited to introduce Saurav Goshal. What? what? Welcome, Saurav. Thank you very much. I wish everyone introduced you with so much gusto. <laughs> I'm just, I think we've both been like really excited for this episode. So like, it's just months of, uh, uh, weeks of prep going into this. <laughs> good to know, good to know. Welcome, Saurav. How are you feeling? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm actually very nervous. I don't know what's going to be hitting me <laughs> over the next hour. So, so I'm just uh, strapped in and hopefully getting through this in one piece. So, so we'll see how it goes. Well, I have to say, like, out of all the people who know that uh, you are coming on the pod, one person specifically was very, very excited, and that's my mother. <laughs> I don't know if that's <laughs> that should excite you, or I don't know what that is. Like, your your fan um, age ranges are very diverse. My mom's always been lukewarm to most of the podcast episode, and then when I said, "Oh, mom, it's all it's coming," she's just been like, "So like." Should I be quiet? What time is it happening? Are you editing Saurav's episode? Can I look? And I'm just like, yeah. <laughs> well, I think the moral of the story is every single episode, you should come on even for a little bit and then your mom will yeah. like every episode. <laughs> yeah. Please, uh, please give her my regards. And uh, like I said, I hope I live up to her expectations as well. Um, Saurav, before we like get into the nitty gritty, I, the first question both Ria and I have to ask you is what according to you is like the definition of fitness for a high performing athlete look i think uh, fitness is subjective to to the sport you play um, i think every sport has uh, you know its unique uh, set of characteristics which uh, which are important to kind of imbibe in yourself if you want to be at the top of your sport um, so I mean, a very, very small example would be, you know, like something like squash and badminton. Both are racket sports, uh, but they're both very, very different in terms of uh, what you need to work on uh, for your fitness. So uh, squash is a, is a sport where you're obviously going front and backwards and sideways a lot, but you're close to the ground a lot of the time. Uh, whereas badminton, you're doing a lot of, uh, a lot of jumping, you know, and, and in squash, you hardly do that. So, uh even though, you know, a lot of our squash players could claim to be uh, one of the fittest athletes on the planet, uh, if we do play um, a proper game of badminton against someone who's really good, uh, the constant jumping is going to take its toll and we're going to start feeling it both in the lungs and both in the legs. Uh, so I think uh, that's something very important to understand uh, that um, being fit in general is, 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 is one part of... Um, you know, the, the jigsaw puzzle almost. Uh, so obviously everyone has, all top athletes have a base level of physicality, which is, which is beyond the norm. And that's why they are where they are. Uh, but over and above that, um, I think everything is tuned in to be specific towards their sport. And I think the best athletes, no matter which sport they're in, work uh, towards, you know, specificity in terms of what they really need to do, whether it be on a, football field or a squash court um, or, uh, or a tennis court. Uh, I think that is very, very important to, to get the best out of yourself uh, and, and show uh, what you can do to uh, be the best athlete you can be in that particular sport. Of course, it's not easy. It's hard. Uh, sessions that you do, no matter what sport you're in, um, are, are brutal. And, and, and the normal person would think about it. And even actually the athlete himself or herself Whilst you're doing it, you're thinking about it, thinking, what am I putting myself through? I'm absolutely <laughs> crazy over here. Uh, but the funny part is that as you get better, as you get stronger, um, as you kind of start winning more, um, you start enjoying that pain. And then you start, uh, uh, you know, 
loving that that picture of yourself where you're struggling with yourself uh, and you come out of it a lot stronger and um, you understand that it's all going to be worth it at some point it's all kind of work that goes into the bank which will mature hopefully at the most opportune time for yourself and your career so so yeah so for me fitness is is something that that is a prerequisite at top level sport uh, i don't think you can get away without the physicality in today's world uh, in any sport really and and uh, but it's important to remember that that physicality has to be to to aid you to be a better player it's not about lifting 200 pounds uh, doing a particular exercise and feeling like oh wow i'm brilliant it's great yeah. if that's going to help you be a better player uh, but uh, at the same time if lifting 50 pounds and doing it correctly makes you a better player that's what fitness is about so i think that's a very important thing for for anyone to understand if they want to be at the top of their game uh, in any sport at any age something you said raised an off the cuff question for me so blame yourself if you think it's a weird question there we question. go <laughs> <laughs> so i'm also known for doing this <laughs> yeah 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 but yeah. so i think something that really stood out is last episode we actually talked a lot about how your body gets accustomed to workouts and how you have to continue to shock your body when you really want to see like some sort of change or challenge yourself and obviously you're repeatedly tr- training for one specific sport probably longer than most people have for their entire lives how do you continuously shock your body when you're training for one specific type of sport and continuously build up i guess like your stamina and endurance while still going after that one thing um i think for me the best way to answer that would be to almost kind of tell you a little bit of what i do with my sport um and how i uh kind of train um for for all the thing that i have to deal with on the squash court uh so me and my physical trainer who actually happens to live in philadelphia um, hey! <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. he's uh, he's a english guy who i've been working with uh, since 2013 Uh, so what we do is that uh, we obviously look at the tournaments that we have, and that kind of creates uh, periods of training for us through the year. Uh, and we look at uh, the immediate past uh, in terms of the tournaments that I've played, the matches that I've played, and and we look at you know very intricately uh, what movements or uh, what phases of play um, have hurt me the most. Uh, and we we look at patterns of movement and things uh, where we are using. a particular leg moving in like the dominant leg so obviously if if there is um you know a weakness in coming out of a particular uh corner with a leading leg then that leg is not doing enough work to get out as quickly as we possibly can uh, i think it's also very important to understand that uh, you know going from a to b quickly is important but it's almost um as important to go from b back to a because you don't want to leave spaces on the court uh so i think that's something that people, a lot of people forget uh, that you could be quick but it's also about being quick in your recovery back to your original starting spot um so so we look at that and we we devise different kind of movement patterns different strength stuff based on that uh to to kind of kind of almost train the body to be better in those those areas so something that we've kind of incorporated um over the last i don't know like a year year and a half is that we do a lot of movement work on court and we've started doing stuff where we do like sets of like 3 and a half minutes but like the first minute is is 60 seconds but then we take like 30 seconds off and then we do like three sets of 15 second like all out blast uh or with like 15 seconds each um and then we take another 15 seconds off and then we go again for the 60 seconds and we do that all over again so the basic idea of that is to basically tell my body that after like 60 seconds of like you know moderate level speed hosting or movement work um then at about 85 90 seconds to really blast it if i can do that consistently then when i'm playing a match against you know a lot of the people who are very attritional and kind of kind of keep hitting hitting it back to me a lot of the time and get a lot of balls back it doesn't affect me anymore because i've been through it already and it's yeah. and i've been through it in a much harder sense So so I think that's something that I've done over the last one and a half years. It's also very very important to to understand and realize that whether it be in your fitness or in your in terms of skill development you have to pick two or three things at a time to get better at. 
If you pick 10 things, you're not going to get better at all of them. You're going to make very, very small improvements. So you need to pick two or three things and make them really good and then move on to the next. So that's why, you know, in, in essence, you know, when every athlete says that, you know, success is not, a, not an overnight process, right? Mm -hmm. They're not saying that just because they want to. The truth of the matter is that it's impossible for it to be an overnight success <laughs> because, uh, you know, you have to do all these things over a different period of time. And when, you know, you keep building sequentially through all these two, three different things and incrementally adding to your skill set, to your physicality, then at some point in time, all these things come together to make you the player or the champion you are, right? And you don't know when that's going to happen. For some people, it happens quicker. For some people, it takes longer, right? But it is a sequential step. It doesn't happen all in one go. Like, Rhea, I, you, I don't know if you've seen Saurav on court, but he is a beast. Like, he is one of the fastest. Like, he's literally, like, if there's one example I can give you is, like, an elastic band. Anytime, literally every time I see, I've seen Saurav as a junior and even now, he's literally the same. He's so fast. He is, like, he can make the tallest person stretch their muscles even harder than they possibly ever can because he's always there. You blink and he's right there. So, it makes complete sense that you've put in so much work, Saurav. But... I'm going to like actually segue into another question that you yourself have touched on is, is, you know, when you said how, you know, when you hit the rougher frustrating parts, training can be a bit of a stretch, right? Like it, it, you know, this is kind of building the endurance, the mental endurance and the physical endurance. I'm curious to know how you keep your sanity. So your mindset in, in check, your training mindset in check, when you have these setbacks that come your way. You know, I can't sugarcoat it. It is difficult. Uh, you know, there are times in the life of every athlete where you want to throw in the towel and say, this is not for me, right? Uh, it's the easiest thing in the world to carry on when you're successful uh, because, you know, the, the happiness, the, the addiction to success keeps you going uh, and you feel great about yourself and, and it kind of papers over uh, any kind of frustrations that you might have. Right. When when you lose, um, it hurts and it hurts because you put in that amount of work. Uh, if you didn't put in that amount of work, then it wouldn't matter that much. Right. It's because you put in so much uh, when you lose and you lose. And sometimes you lose for a while. You know, there's a period where you lose and and it hurts. And it's very, very difficult to uh, to put yourself back up. And and I'm not saying, you know, you, you have this after one loss. After one loss, you say, OK, I need to get back onto the horse straight hard again and I'm going to come back. You keep doing that, but then life keeps knocking you back down, like, you know, any, anyway. Um, and, and you reach a point where you go like, you know what, this is not, this is not working, right? Um, I myself have had, I don't know, maybe three or four instances, vivid instances in my career where I've kind of thought I should just stop. I should just retire. You know, and it's been at different points in my career, whether it be at 18 or 23 or 27 or 32 or whatever, right? Um, but I think, I mean, at least for me, the one thing that kind of always kept me going um, is one, obviously, you know, like I've always had ambition uh, to, to know, to be, you know, the best I can be and, and try to get to world number one and, and be world champion one day. Uh, but also... It's almost weird and it's almost very simplistic, but it's also like I've always felt when I wanted to stop, the first thing that's kind of almost like knocked my knocked in my head really loudly is that, you know what, I can't finish my entire career on, on a loss, on like a bad loss. Mm. Like I can't finish with that memory for something that has, you know, given me so much for so long in life. I can't finish with that memory. You know, if I want to finish, I want to finish well might not be with a win but with a memory where you know i feel good about myself i feel that you know i've given everything uh, to this game that has given me so much in life and and you know that's kind of like put me back on track a little bit to say okay i need to like work hard again so that i can push once more to to give myself that that one last good memory and then funnily enough you know everyone i truly believe has as a different mindset um, to, to, to playing, to, to life. And it's, uh, 
important for, for everyone to, to recognize that for themselves. I don't think anyone can, can truly help you. I think people can, including psych, sports psychologists, can maybe point you in the right direction, maybe help you recognize that. But at the end of the day, you have to, you have to see it for yourself and tap into it for yourself because no one knows you better than you know yourself. Right? Yep. And it takes, it takes a lot of courage to, you know, you know, people say it takes a lot of courage to open yourself up to someone else. Uh, but to me, it takes even more courage to open yourself up to yourself. Uh, because at the end of the day, you're, you know, you, you're living your life for yourself. True. It's true when they say that, you know, the mind can take your body where the body doesn't think it can go. Um, and, and that's true. And, and you feel that when you do the most brutal sessions, you feel that, okay, you know, you're going to die here, but then you push through, you push through, not because, uh, you know, you, uh, your body is, is, is unbelievable. You push through because your mind takes you there. Uh, right. But it's a, it's a, it's a give and take process. The, the body does what the mind wants it to do, but the mind can only go if the body is capable of doing it at some level. So, so you've got to train both the body and the mind uh, to kind of work in, in unison, in tandem, to, to give you the best um, you can be. I love yeah. that you said that. I really yeah. Because we keep, we stress, this whole month we've been stressing that fitness is such a comprehensive journey. It's not just going to the gym or going to like doing your running training if, you're, if you want to run a marathon. It's a, it's a bit of everything. So I'm glad For you sure. mentioned that. I have a question kind of about that because I love what you said about one, like you are the only one who really knows what's going on both in yourself and in your body, but also the mind-body connection. Can you talk a little bit about like maybe times where you've realized that your body maybe like isn't keeping up or like your body is showing signs of like fatigue and I guess like one the struggle between being like no I know I have to hit certain goals to get me to where I want to be but knowing your body isn't lacking and just how you deal with those situations or what you do for yourself then I mean I think the the most vivid example I can give you right now is um, is, is a match I played like uh, on the 24th of February I'm actually injured right now uh, so I'm, I'm recovering I'm in rehab uh, but basically uh, I injured my right abductor stroke hamstring like three days before in practice um, in the mat before the match on the 24th of February and I wasn't sure if I was going to play the match um, and um, you know I did whatever I had to do uh, when I started the match my leg was probably at about 80 percent uh, I knew going into the match that um, I I kind of needed to protect the leg going into certain corners and 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 you know doing certain movements um, but um, I knew that it was 80 percent so I could get away with it if my squash was was kind of really good. Um, started really well, um, but the middle of the first game, the injury started, you know, really, really playing up. Um, and at this point, um, I'm just like, I'm definitely struggling here. Um, I don't know, um, you know, how long the leg is going to last. Uh, there are kind of things going on in my head. That was my first tournament of this season. Uh, I have a big season coming up. So there are kind of thoughts going into my head that if I keep playing, am I going to make it worse? Is it going to kind of ruin the entirety of my season? Because the abductor is, and the hamstring is something which can get chronic and it's very difficult to deal with. Uh, so all these things going through my head. And I won that match in five, uh, five games. Um, I played in a way... Uh, which, to be honest, I'm really, really proud of because it's not easy to do what I did against a player who was playing really, really well on the day as well. Um, I, I, I kind of used my squash uh, to the best of my ability to hit the corners that I wanted to hit, hit patterns that I wanted to hit. I was extremely disciplined in, in terms of, uh, you know, um, which patterns I wanted to play so that I could protect the leg as much as possible. Um, I did really, really well to, to mask the fact that uh, I had a problem with my leg. Uh, my opponent, until after I spoke to him after the match, had no idea that there was something wrong with my leg. Um, for me, I think that's, uh, that's something I'm really, really proud of because, uh, you know, I, I dealt with, with pain, I'd, physical pain. I dealt with uh, 
you know, the mental stress of, of the pain itself, but also about thinking about the future. Uh, and in the midst of all of that, I maintained enough clarity in my head to play the squash the way I needed to play to win that match. Um, so um, I think the key to all of that is, is clarity. Uh, I think clarity is very important uh, in terms of uh, achieving high performance. Uh, whether you're physically fully fine, whether you're not f- fully fine, um, the key is to basically be very, very composed, um, yet, you know, be at, at, at a kind of like on the threshold of being aggressive because you need that intensity uh, at, at the very top level. Uh, if you can find that almost, uh, it's, it's, it's almost like the Zen like state uh, where, where you're, where at one point, at kind of it, in one second, you're ready to kind of explode. But at the same time, you can rein the entire thing in, 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 in a millisecond as well. Um, and I think if you can have that clarity of mind, uh, I think you can achieve unbelievable things. So it's important to always remember that, uh, you know, the mind is a very, very strong uh, uh, kind of weapon for you. It's, um, it's, it's, it's almost more important than, than everything else when, uh, when you come on like the biggest stage or the D-Day to perform. Because all the other stuff, uh, you know, you've already prepared for and, and it's going to take you uh, where, where you need it. So, you know, all the skills that you developed is there in your arsenal. The physicality that you've done, it's already there. You can't do anything on the day. Uh, whereas the mentality is what determines whether you can use those uh, things in your arsenal to produce what you need to produce. If the mentality is not there, you're not going to be able to do what you need to do. Coach used to say, girls, you got to fake it till you make it on court. Like, you don't care yeah. about what's happening outside the court. We don't care if you're nervous. We don't like you must have played a five setter game or for normal people, like you must have pushed yourself in the gym the day before or ran 10 miles extra. But like the next day, just kind of pretend like you're fine. Go through the motions and then your body will automatically know how to get back into that Zen like state. You know, it's like, yeah. for example, yeah. in terms of running, you're in that last mile of running and your re- legs are like done But then you've hit that spot of just, like you said, sort of that Zen-like state where it's just like, I'm on a runner's high. I'm just going to run through the last mile and I'm going to finish it. And before you know it, you're so deeply involved in the moment. There's so much clarity that you make it through the finish line. So I'm really glad that you brought that point up. The greatest champions. It's not like they have like a magic wand and, and, you know, they're they're producing things in the moment. No, it's about fooling fooling your mind. Uh, it's about masking everything else. It's about the processes that make make you be in that moment. Well, I also think like fitness is something where it's a lot easier for people to be like, this is my end goal. Like, and it's especially when people have like a cosme- a cosmetology like thing in there. I don't know if that was even the right word, but wait, basically when you have a picture in your head and you're like, I want my body to look like that, you keep looking at the big quote unquote picture and pushing yourself there whereas it could be like almost like you said like it's the moment of like doing that certain exercise or pushing your body in a certain way and it's a lot more tailored down to like those individual moments that build up your journey than just like a whole journey on its own for sure I think look having goals is really important uh, because that stops you from drifting right it gives you a benchmark to to aspire to right but um, it's very important to always remember that uh, there are stepping stones towards that, that goal. And, and those stepping stones are, are extremely important. So uh, you want to be world number one, you're not getting to world number one in one day, right? You've got to go through a million kind of rungs before you get there. Um, and you've got to go through different phases in your, in your career uh, in terms of your quality that you have to get there. So, so it's important to kind of, understand that, realize that, um, and, and, and just have this kind of um, unending desire to get better. I think mm-hmm. getting better uh, and better than what you were yesterday. I think going into every training session, telling yourself that today I'm going to do this better. You know, those small incremental um, improvements will add up. Uh, so, you know, they say uh, that, you know, every drop makes an ocean, right? It is true. 
uh, you know, nature is, is, is a very good uh, kind of mirror to, to, to life. Uh, you know, every drop makes an ocean. Every single piece of incremental improvement makes a world champion or a legend, right? And um, you learn from the best of times and you learn from the worst of times. Um, you know, sometimes people think you only learn from losses. No, the best, the very, very best learn from wins as well because you know that I won today. I won because I did something else. But tomorrow, if I play the other person again, or if I play someone else, they might do something else differently, right? Mm-hmm. So what did, I, uh, what did I do today, which I might have to change tomorrow to be better, right? So it's a constant thirst of, of being better. Um, and, you know, a lot of us have this, almost this, uh, this idea of attaining perfection, right? Mm-hmm. We want perfection. Um, it's very difficult to attain perfection. It's, um, it's impossible almost. Um, and it's, um, it's almost a futile attempt, right? But um, that's what drives us. Um, so even if, even if you won, you still, still think that, oh, you know, I could have done this better, right? Uh, and, that, and that drives us. Uh, but at the same time, you have to have the balance uh, when you're playing to, uh, to understand that perfection is elusive. Um, you don't have to be perfect every day to win every match. You just have to be better than the other person, mm-hmm. right? Um, so I think that's very, very important to, to know. And uh, I think this is something that I learned uh, from Andre Agassi's autobiography, actually. Oh, it's um, such a good actually, book. It's right here. It is. It is very good. It is very good. Uh, and he actually says it in his book that, you know, when I was growing up, I wanted to be perfect, right? And Brad Gilbert, his coach, told him, Andre, you don't need to be perfect every day to win. You just need to be better than the other person. Right. And, and I think that's something very important to, to understand because there are going to be 99.99% of the days that you're on the field or the court where you're not perfect. And if you let that quest for, perfect, for perfection eat at you, it's going to eat you inside out. The greatest champions, it's not like they have like a magic wand and, and you know, they're, they're producing things in the moment. No, it's about fooling your fooling your mind uh, it's about masking everything else it's about the processes that make make you be in that moment I'd love to kind of know I guess your fitness journey when it comes to age progression because one thing I think we hear a lot of from friends and even our listeners is once we start our mid-20s you start to see changes in your bodies which you just weren't ready for because you're still like oh I'm young and I'm 20 but you start to kind of see differences and have to figure out how to adapt your fitness to it. So how do you do that professionally? Um, see, you have to listen to your body. Your body is, um, is, is, is something which uh, will tell you what works for you and what doesn't. Um, so small example, till I was about 19, 20, um, I used to do a lot of like running outside, uh, a lot of, uh, you know, like 400 meter, 800 meter sprints outside on the track um 6k 8k runs outside um i used to uh you know obviously do a lot more of movement work on court there were court sprints on court i've stopped um i don't do any of that now um doesn't mean i'm not as physically fit i'm probably stronger today than what i was when i was 20 um i think i've done a lot more strength work but we've substituted those things for a lot of bike work uh stuff on the rower for the simple reason that the squash as a sport has a lot of impact on your joints. That's why, you know, you, a lot of people have knee and hip issues as they grow older. Uh, so running outside, you're putting even more pressure on the joints, uh, doing court sprints on court, more pressure on the joints. Whereas if you're doing stuff on the bike and the rower, uh, you're still killing the legs, but there's no impact on the joints. Um, and I think that's, that's something that um, as a general kind of trend in my training over the last 15, 20 years, I think that's something which has changed, changed drastically uh, to what I used to do and what I do now. Um, my sessions are probably harder than what they used to be. Uh, uh, but um, it's, 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 it's very like with my trainer, Damon, I think we, we kind of uh, do stuff very, very specific and scientifically to, to what the body uh, is going to take and what the body um, is 
is going to accept so that we can make the body go go longer, go further, and go better. Um, so uh, even if one of the hardest sessions that I do do, which is outside, is 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 I do some hill sprints. Um, hill sprints are brutal, oh. right? Um, I literally do like eight sets uh, of like 45 to 60 seconds, but it's flat out and it's brutal. The only reason we do the hill sprints um, is because when you're going up a hill, um, you can't um, extend your legs a lot because you're going up a hill, right? So your, so your hips don't extend as much as they would if you're running uh, 100 meters or 400 meters, for example, right? Um, and as squash players, we all have very tight hips uh, because we're always crouching at the at the T, so to say, and uh, we have very um, kind of tight hips. So if we extend our hips uh, with that kind of velocity, doing a 400 meter, you're you're risking uh, injury to your hip. Whereas if you're doing it on uh, kind of gravel ground or whatever up a hill, you're negating that completely. Right. So the same reason why I would do, uh, you know, like going up steps, for example, like quick. Right. Again, you can't extend your hips that much. Um, so I think it's important uh, for, for people to understand that as you grow older, the joints uh, get weaker. Right. That's that's just normal for anyone. Um, and you got to do everything you can to to take the pressure off those joints. Right. And um, as you grow older warming up and cooling down is paramount right i could get onto a squash court when i was 17 18 not warm up for a single second and fly around the court today if i don't warm up i'm useless right um and and it's it's weird like your body kind of gets used to kind of that process and it only functions when that trigger is is set so once you get used to that your body won't kind of listen to you to do what you want it to do if you don't warm up. And the same goes with cooling down, right? You know, if you don't cool down properly, the next day your body will start crying for it, saying that, why didn't you do it, right? So, so it's, it's kind of the body, body's way to tell you that this is what it needs and you need to give it what it needs, right? Um, so, so I think these things are, are important that as you grow older, it's important to to accept that you're growing older, to accept the changes that your body is making um, and, and to tailor your training based on that, right? And also something that is also very important, whether you're young, old, it doesn't matter, but it's something like, you know, in the gym, I see so many people doing a million different exercises in a million wrong ways, right? And uh, all they bother about is, you know, how much am I going to lift? You know, am I lifting more? Lifting more is not uh, the key to being uh, better toned, right? Lifting a certain amount of weight, but correctly is, is the key to getting there. And at, that's the key to, to uh, being able to do it for a long period of time, right? The more you do stuff in the wrong way, the more the body is going to get killed for it. And you might not see it today. You will see it at some point in time later in the future, right? Yeah. So you always have to kind of keep that in mind whenever you're doing whatever you're doing and yeah. if at any point in time it feels it feels wrong right or you're it's hurting you where it shouldn't hurt that's the first telltale sign that you're doing it the wrong way right and you got to kind of almost you know a lot of people have this this ego that you know I have to do um, a squat with x amount of weight right otherwise I'm just soft right no there are so many times, even today, like I would do a squat with just a bar, right? Nothing else. That's light. I mean, I can lift the bar with one hand, right? But that's not the point. The point is that those sessions are based around mobility, you know, and it's not purely about lifting high or hard. So, so I think that's something that everyone needs to, to almost incorporate into their, into their training. And, and another thing also, like, you know, everyone thinks every session needs to be ridiculously hard for you to be uh, physically a beast. No, the body needs a few easy sessions as well, right? A body needs to, to kind of uh, recuperate happily whilst doing the work as well. It's like life. 
uh, if you're going to, uh, you know, be kind of driven and just working every single minute of the day and don't have any happy moments in life, you're going to lose out uh, on the joy of doing what you're really doing. You're preaching to the choir, literally. It to <laughs> I just opened the chat to tell before, but I was like, I feel attacked. <laughs> we're, we're terrible. We have no work-life balance, so you're, you're no, but, speaking. But that's true, the you know. It's, uh, it's, it's so important to, to kind of give yourself, your head, your mind, your body, those, those moments, because believe it or not, those moments will help you reach the potential that you have. If you continuously keep killing your body and killing your mind, um, you're not going to be able to kind of um, embrace the special talent uh, or, 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 you know, the, the unbelievable gift that you have uh, inside of you. Uh, you won't be able to have uh, the clarity of mind to be able to, uh, you know, touch that uh, and, and feel that, feel that power inside you. You need that that space and you need that time both for your mind and for your body to, to feel that, feel that special thing inside of you at different points in time to, to really express yourself. And that's why, you know, that's why when you're training, let's say you're going into a tournament, you, you bring the training back a little bit. You don't kill yourself as much. Why? Because you want the body to be fresh and you want the mind to be fresh. You want to be, you want the, both the body and the mind to be excited to play the tournament because it wants more. You always want your mind and your body wanting more before you stop, right? Yeah. And that's, whereas when you're really just training, you're not so bothered about that. You're pushing it to the next level, to the next level, to the next level, right? So, so it's something that you need to, again, understand for yourself what that threshold is and, and figure out how you can bring out the best in yourself. You bring about like a really good point that, you know, we actually wanted to ask you as well is, like most 20 year olds right now are in this, I wouldn't say toxic, but we're in this kind of culture of being programmed of just going at it, even with fitness, right? Like five days a week, I want to hit five days of hard workouts so that I deserve that weekend off. You know, the whole mentality about approaching fitness is so like, I want to give my hundred percent. So like you said, I want to like squat harder than like the right way of doing it because apparently that's the right way to get the gains. Um, how important, and you've already touched upon this and we're curious to know in general about your recovery process, right? Like what are some things that you do that helps you unwind from the grunt of the work that you're putting your body through? Uh, some things we can learn to incorporate in our lives as well. I think the first and most important thing and the simplest thing, believe, believe me, is sleep. Sleep is highly, highly underrated. My wife makes fun of me because I want to sleep in the afternoon. She's like, you want to sleep every day. And I'm like, trust me, it's so important, right? Uh, the sleep is the body's natural mechanism to recover, right? Yeah. That's the only time in the entire day when you can switch the mind off, right? To a certain extent. And when the mind switches off, that's when the body does its magic to, to get, get back to where you want it to be. Right. So sleep is extremely important. So, um, you know, even though you might have a lot of work or you're training really hard or whatever it is, right, you have to find time to sleep and sleep well. You know, that is that is extremely important. Um, I think also to kind of find things in your life which help you switch off from your kind of daily grind, whatever it might be. Right? Um, so it could be watching a TV show, could be listening to music, could be going for a run, um, could be playing playing a sport, anything, could be playing board games, could be chilling with with your I don't know, nephew or or your grandparents, whatever it might be, right? Again, it's something for you to figure out what works for you. Um, you need that so that you can switch off from from thinking about what you want to achieve in life. Right. So obviously for me. Um, I'm constantly thinking about how can I be a better sports player? What do I need to do to be better? How would I beat this person? You know, I'm visualizing different matches, visualizing different opponents, visualizing different situations in matches, right? But if I keep doing that consistently all the time, I'm going to burn out. It's not going to be sustainable, right? You want to, um, you want to achieve your best, but it has to be sustainable. There's no point being a, 
you know, like a, like a one tournament wonder or, uh, you know, a flash in the pan. It's uh, legends are made not from that. Legends and the greatest are made because they do it over and over and over again. Right. So today, uh, you know, someone like Cristiano Ronaldo or Lionel Messi, right? Why, you know, does everyone say that they're two of the greatest ever? Because they've done it for so long. It's mind boggling for how long they've done it for. Like today, the next heir apparent is supposed to be Kylian Mbappe, right? I read a stat the other day. He needs to score something like 50 goals a season for the next like 12 seasons to even get close to the number of goals Ronaldo scored. That is insane. Yeah. He's, not, he's not scored 50 goals a season in one season yet, right? Uh, and that just shows you how good these two are, right? Why is Usain Bolt considered the greatest sprinter of all time? Because he's won the 100 and 200 gold medal three Olympics in a row. No one's ever done it, right? No one's ever medaled three Olympics in a row in 100 and 200, let alone winning the gold, right? So these things are what make you the greatest. You know, in tennis, you have Djokovic, Federer, Nadal. I was, th- I was hoping you'd say Roger Federer first, but you said Djokovic. We'll excuse you. <laughs> I mean, you know, Apurva, I am I'm a massive, massive Roger I Federer know, fan. I know, I but, know. But, but... I don't want to hear it if it's Djokovic. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think with the, with the, bal- the balance of play right now, Djokovic is going to end up with the most. But whatever it is, these three are the greatest ever for what they've done for so long. Right? It's unreal what they've done. And that is why they're legends. So it's about, you know, seeing the long game. It's about seeing how you can go longer. You know, it's about having sustainability, whether it be in sport, whether it be in fitness, whether it be in business, whether it be in life. You don't want, you know, the, the joy of achieving whatever you want to achieve to last for a small period of time. Right, you want it to last for as long as you can possibly make it last. Right, yeah. if you're a sports person, your career is finite, for sure. Mm-hmm. Right, but you can elongate that finite as much as possible by doing the right things and giving yourself the right amount of time to to breathe and process everything um, and and enjoy everything that that you're doing whilst you're on that journey as well. And and I think that's very very important to to have that, uh, it's fine to have a single-minded focus, uh, but you can still have that space and time to, to give yourself that space and time to, to kind of unwind and, and, and detach yourself. And, and, and it's, it's almost imperative so that you remain healthy, moving in, you know, moving through life as well. I really like what you also said about disconnecting and sleeping and the quality of sleep. Because I think as we're going through this, like we have so much to do in a day, you'll measure out like, okay, I need to sleep. All right, whatever, I'll sleep 12 to eight. That's eight hours, check mark, you should be moving on. But you don't think about, did I actually get eight hours of sleep? Was that like poor quality sleep or good quality sleep? For sure, you know, like every time I put an alarm and it's like less than nine hours from the time I'm putting it, I feel like, damn, I haven't, I don't think I'm going to get enough Uh, because it's not because I want nine hours of sleep. It's because um, I feel that that gives me like a buffer time to kind of, you know, there is going to be, you know, like time within the time you sleep where you're not sleeping brilliantly. Yeah. Right. Uh, But you want to kind of give yourself as much time as possible uh, to, to get that. Now, I do understand that every day is not going to be possible, right? You have things to do. That's the, that's the truth, right? But you've got to find time through the week to make up for that if you haven't got it, right? So, you know, coming back to, you know, when, when I think Apurva said that, you know, we want to live five days a week and do it a certain way because we want to deserve the weekend, right? That's- it's, um, it's not, you know, getting fit is not the end game to go enjoy yourself. Yep. That's not the way it works, right? Um, it's about... Doing both, I mean, of course, as a, as a top athlete, you can't do that really every week, but I'm saying in general, <laughs> in general, it's about doing both in, uh, in moderation. You know, moderation in life is very, is very, very important. You can do both. You can go have a great time and you can 
still work out and, and, and be physically healthy and, and, and be the best version of yourself. But it's about having that moderation in what you do. No matter how much you work out, if you go in every weekend, Friday, Saturday, if you're like downing, I don't know, 20 shots and like not sleeping at all, you're back to square one on Monday again, right? So you're not making any gains really in life, right? So you got to understand that and, and, and know that, you know, to make gains, you've got to give your body the time of rest. Um, and if through the week you've not slept much, maybe you need to sacrifice going out at least one of the days uh, rather than, you know, both. Um, so everything is about, you know, making sure that it's sustainable. So, uh, you know, if you're, you know, going to go hard five days a week, every week, it's not sustainable. You know, you're, you're going to break down after, it could be after one month, could be after two years, but you are going to break down, right? So it's about understanding that and making sure that what you do today, you can do, you know, obviously not at the same intensity, but you can keep doing that as you grow older, right? Yeah. So, so I, you know, I get so much inspiration from looking at, you know, some really old people coming to the gym or getting onto a squash court who are like 70, 75, 80 years old. And I look at them and I'm like, do I think I'm going to be able to like do what they're doing? And it's, it's brilliant what they're doing. And it's, it's unbelievable with, you know, the, the joy they have whilst they're doing it. Their lives are, in my opinion, so much better than people who aren't that physically fit because I think it gives them uh, the opportunity to do so many more things in life. It could be playing with their grandkids a lot more actively, for example. It's just a very small thing, right? It just gives them so much more purpose. I think, I think life becomes futile when you don't have that purpose. And as you grow older, um, your purpose in life starts kind of dwindling away and that's a natural phenomenon because you start your life when you're in school and you want to get good grades get into a good college then you go in and you want to go into the corporate world or whatever world you want to go into and do really well for yourself and then you start a family and then you want to do well by your family but then after you reach a certain point you probably think okay i've done my bit and now it's on to the next generation and now what do i do right uh, you can, you may have hobbies that you want to do but it's still just a hobby it's not it's not something which is driving you every day to, to a particular goal. You're just drifting, right? But mm. if you have, you know, that sustainability and, and that long-term view of everything that you've done from when you're younger, I think, I mean, of course, I'm not, I'm not reached that stage yet, but from talking to some of these older people and seeing, seeing the way they live, they live their life now, I feel like that's where I want to be. You know, I want to be at that stage where, um, I want to be physically able enough to do what I want to do um, and, and go where I want to go and travel if I want to and, and you know, do everything that I want to do till the time I have on this planet. Um, and I think um, that's, that's something if you can you know, almost look into the future and see for yourself and understand the importance of, of that rest and of that uh, you know, uh, moderation in, in everything that you do in life. Uh, so that later on in life, you you have that life that you would want at that point as well. I think it, it gives you almost a drive to be able to do it this way now rather than suffer later almost. Yeah. I feel like most 20-year-olds who are going to listen to this, they're going to have to take notes because this whole last segment where you just spoke about kind of the long game, I think that's really, um, at least for me, a big takeaway or like something I want to reiterate too is like most of us think of it as a as a very like, Ria said cosmetology example where you're just like you want to look good you want to get through like the next couple of years looking looking pretty hot for the Instagram or whatever but like it's more about the long game you know you want to I'm so glad you brought up the old people example because um, my brother and I we used to when we lived in Portland together we'd go on a lot of hikes and we'd see a lot of these old people oh, who yeah. climbed the freaking mountain and that was kind of like a yeah. good hard look at ourselves when my brother and I would always say we want to be that person when we are 20 30 40 years from now climb or hike at the rate they're going rather than panting and worrying yeah. about everything so this is like pretty pretty good uh, advice that you've given us but we want to throw you under the bus with one last little piece of segment this is something we didn't warn you about but we do this with most of our guests it's like the very amateur version of our rapid fire round and we've actually right. got a couple of questions from 
a couple people too who are excited and interested to know what you have to say. So don't think too much. Quick answers. Let's let's uh, hit it with with uh, the first question. Nay or Calcutta? Calcutta. I was born there. <laughs> uh tv show you're currently watching suspicion on apple tv i've never heard of that show yeah me too uma thurman it's very good watch it Ooh. Okay. um what other sports do you sort of like to play in his free time do you have free time I, <laughs> honestly i don't play any other sport right now but uh, i used to play a lot of badminton and cricket so yeah, i guess one of the two Okay. Um, favorite quote unquote cheat meal? Uh, my favorite meal is, is mutton biryani. Uh, that would be my last supper. Um, but I'm a big sweet person. I have a massive sweet tooth thanks to my mom. So pretty much any dessert. I love dessert. I think it's man's greatest invention. Ice cream. Wow. <laughs> Are you an Indian dessert or like? Both, both. I think I don't really like as much as like cheesecake. I'm not a big cheesecake oh, yeah, person, yeah, yeah, yeah. but 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 other than that, like I love everything. Like eclairs. Like I go, I go like dessert hunting uh, when I go like to different places on, on, on in the world. Actually, speaking of your biggest fan and a fellow ice cream lover as well, this person is obsessed with you. We all know who she is. Her name is Sunina Kurvela, and she has a question <laughs> for you. One thing you despise about today's fitness culture. <laughs> That everyone does it just to look good. Good stuff. I like that. Um, all right, favorite workout. Uh, this is a tough one. <laughs> uh, it's probably a bike session, but it's almost one of the most brutal sessions. But it's probably a bike session. Other than playing a sport, I, okay. like playing sport is always number one. But if it's just basically just in the gym, then yeah, bike session. Sort of. Do you also remember Soul Cycle? <laughs> Of course, that's not a bike session. <laughs> Thought of me and Sunaina, we went for a soul cycle session in, in San Francisco. And he was just like, he was like, you know, the instructor was like, you know, make it to the highest resistance when he comes to Saurav's bike. And Saurav's like, but this is my highest resistance. Like, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, that was funny. He actually came off his bike and he was checking yeah. it. So I was like, I'm yeah. telling you, man, it is on the highest one. <laughs> Um, this is from my brother and he said, he sort of is, is sort of high maintenance or low maintenance as a person? Oh, you got to ask my wife that. I think she's probably going to say I'm high maintenance. So I'll go with that. I, I think I have low maintenance, but what do I know? Last question from another friend of mine. You know her too. Her name is Mary, Mary Fungafat. Uh, yeah. she says, Hashtag body goals. Her question is, who's your fitness icon? Oof. Wow. Yeah, I actually top don't... Three, top, three. top two. I actually don't have a fitness icon. Uh, okay. But if I can, like, kind of, like, switch that question around to, like, top three favorite sports people, maybe? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. yeah so I'd, I'd go, like, uh, Roger Federer, Usain Bolt, and uh, Sachin. Yeah, those are my three favorite. Yeah. Love, love that. Love that answer. Love number one there. Uh, <laughs> but, um, but sort of, thank you so, so much for hopping on the pod with us. I hope you had fun. I hope we picked your brains enough for you to get a little deep. <laughs> well, I hope I, I satisfied and satiated your, your thirst for some decent answers. So, yeah. No, you definitely gave us a great answers. Thank you, Saurav. This was so much fun. 